Hello and welcome to this first look exploring session, this first session looking at Jocasta, a tragedy written in Greek by Euripides, translated and digested into acts by George Gascoigne and Francis Kinwelmersh of Gray's Inn, and there by them presented in 1566. Well, sort of. That's what it may say. Um, this is a tragedy uh, homeopathically connected to a play in Greek by Euripides. It is a translation of a play by Ludovico uh, Dolce uh, called Geocaster, uh, which is connected uh, to some degree with Euripides' Phoenician uh, women, uh, but it's not a direct uh, adaptation uh, translation. Uh, there is a there are a lot of differences, uh, and we're not really here to figure out what those are. That's we're just here to find out how this play functions and how it's all going to go down. Uh, we've already been uh, in the company of uh, George Gascoigne, and I have a sneaking suspicion we've been at least briefly in the uh, the presence of Francis Kinwelmersh, but I can't remember what play he may or may not have had. Uh, uh, his uh, uh, grubby little digits on. Uh, anyway, for today, we are going to um, dig into this text uh, and find out how it functions. We've got quite a lot to get through as we go from Act 1 into the beginning of Act 2. So reading today, definitely reading service is... Hi, I'm Eric. And um, I know we were all smiling at the beginning, but this is not going to end well. It's a tragedy. Spoilers. Spoilers there. Um, <laughs> reading Jocasta today is... Liza Graham. I mean, it might end well. I prefer to remain hopeful. I mean, you got to, right? Travel in hope, but not necessarily with hopeful aspirations. We shall see. We shall see. It might all, it might all come out well in the end. Uh, Rachel uh, reading Antigone and Polynices is... Hi, I'm Rachel. Uh, reading uh, the dumb shows, uh, maybe sharing the chorus, and also reading a Teocles is uh, muted at the moment. So some wonderful hand waving there. Hi, I'm David. Hopefully the good will end happily and the bad unhappily. And uh, reading uh, uh, Balio or Balio and maybe some additional odds and ends as well will be. Hi, I'm Angela. Looking forward to being one of Gascoigne's girls today. Yes, we, we, we really enjoyed Supposes, uh, but I think this may be uh, showing the range. And as I say, this is a, a joint work written by three hands, uh, as well as George and Francis. We also have a Christopher Yelverton, but we won't get to his work until the final session. Uh, we are going to start with a, uh, a, an act by Kinwell Mersh. Kinwell Mersh. Um, in a moment, we have an argument first, which Angela is going to read for us. I don't know who wrote the argument uh, before we get to some dumb shows. But uh, let's have the argument of the tragedy, please. To scourge the crime of wicked Eleus and wreck the foul incest of Oedipus. The angry gods stirred up their sons by strife with blades embrued to reeve each other's rife life. The wife, the mother, and the concubine, whose fearful heart foredread their fatal fine, her sons thus dead disdaineth longer life, and slays herself with self-same bloody knife. The daughter, she, surprised with childish dread that durst not die, a loathsome life doth lead, yet rather choose, chose to guide her banished sire than cruel Creon should have his desire. Creon is king, the type of tyranny, figure, and Oedipus, mirror of misery, Fortunatus in phallix. So that may have been circulating in text form. Uh, uh, it may be presented as an actual prologue. Uh, we shall discuss that later. Let's have a dumb show. So the order of the dumb shows and musics before every act. What is it we're seeing and hearing before the play starts? First, before the beginning of the first act, did sound a doleful and strange noise, a vile, cittern, bandurian, and such like, during the which there came in upon the stage a king with an imperial crown upon his head, very richly apparelled, a sceptre in his right hand, a mound with a cross in his left hand, 
sitting in a chariot very richly furnished, drawn in by four kings in their doublets and hosen, with crowns also upon their heads, representing us unto ambition by the history of Sisostris, king of Egypt, who being in his time and reign a mighty conqueror, yet not content to have subdued many princes and taken from them their kingdoms and dominions, did in like manner cause those kings whom he had so overcome to draw in his chariot like beasts and oxen, thereby to content his unbridled ambitions, his ambitious desire. After he had been drawn twice about the stage and retired, the music ceased and Jocasta the Queen issued out of her house, beginning the first act as followeth. Jocasta the Queen issueth out of her palace before her twelve gentlemen, following after her eight gentlewomen, where, whereof four be the chorus that remain on the stage after her departure. At her entrance the trumpet sounded, and after she had gone once about the stage, she turneth to one of her most trusty and esteemed servants, and unto him she discloseth her grief as followeth. And before we go and read uh, that, um, that's an awful lot of people coming yeah. onto that stage. We, we were discussing the other, uh, or we have discussed with some of the Inns of Court plays about how much physical space they have on stage. But if we've got the better part of, what, 19 people there? Um, no, no, more than that, isn't it? It's it's uh, 21. So that's a, that's a lot of bodies yeah, on a stage. I mean, um, it's possible if this was done in summer, perhaps it might have been done in a courtyard. Um uh, a quadrangle, as they would say. Uh, otherwise, I think we still have the stage at Middle Temple Hall, although I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure whether Middle Temple Hall looks much like it did uh, at this time. Uh, someone with better history than me would have to say. Mm. I have no data on that, but uh, it's it's a good question with good speculation. So. Uh... Uh, other thoughts about this? We've got uh, vials. Uh, we've got trumpets as well. The trumpets does uh, lean slightly onto Liza's thought about uh, something less indoors because, uh, yeah, you've got to be careful with trumpets indoors. Um, but, yeah, if you want to wake everyone up with the entrance of a queen, that seems perfectly reasonable. Um, yeah, doleful and strange noise. Um, that's what we're going for, doleful and strange. Um, yeah. So um, after we've been twice drawn about the stage and retired, so we've got this, uh, this, uh, yeah, a very interesting stage picture. Any thoughts on the room very briefly? Uh, Angela, uh, well, Eric? Did, I mean, it's true that the space needs to be large enough as well to cope with a chariot pulled by four men. I mean, that's, that's quite a large uh, object in itself and get off. So you wonder kind of what the space is like to bring it on and also take it off sufficiently. Um, for it to have disappeared. So um, if indeed it does disappear, I'm going to might sit in the corner, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, it's, it is quite amazing to think of the uh, because it's like a pageant, isn't it? This bit, it reads very much like a pageant. Yeah, there's um, the logistics of getting a cart on and off stage. Yeah, I've, I've done shows. That's it's not not fun. It's not fun even when you've got space. So it's it's not easy. Uh, Eric, then that, that's actually what I was going to say. The the imagery, just like a scepter in his right hand, a man with his cross in in his left hand, a very richly furnished chariot. Blah blah blah. It just reads very civic pageantry. <laughs> Yeah, drawn in by four kings. Um, you know, we are we are prefiguring uh, uh, Tamburlaine uh, uh, and um, the other player at exactly the same time that used uh, has people drawing uh, chariots on at it, um, uh, by by twenty odd years. So uh, that's, that's that's going well, David. When you want to represent ambition, do you usually think of Sesostris? It's the first thing that pops into my mind. Um, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I uh, jumped over Rachel. Sorry. Um, no, I was going to say, in terms of the carriage, maybe it's not a wheeled carriage, but, you know, one of those ones that you hold and, you know, like, maybe, maybe that, you know, and it's for one person at every corner holding it. Oh, more of a litter. Um... 
Yeah, I suppose they're, they're drawn in by four kings does sort of uh, does possibly lead in that direction. Uh, Liza, I saw. Oh yeah. Uh, in case anyone was wondering what a Bandurian was, that is the the stage direction is um, a doleful and strange noise of viols, cittern, Bandurian, and such like. Um, and we know what a viol is. Uh, we know what a cittern is. Um, a bandurian apparently is uh, is a bass cittern, so it's uh, it's strung with wires, but its pitch is low. It's a it's it's a fifteen hundreds bass guitar, and apparently invented by the London instrument maker John Rose in fifteen sixty two. Oh, lovely! So you know, four years prior to this, and I just see Eric in chat has got ahead of me in making the uh, the the the, uh, the joke that the uh, bandurian has just finished season 2 on uh, on uh, uh, disney plus uh so um yeah don't even ask who baby, baby yoda marries when he grows up <laughs> brought in uh, baby yoda brought on stage uh, uh by four uh, four kings so um <laughs> anyway we need to move forward uh, we're going to uh, dive into a scene and let it uh, uh, have some air so uh, we have Jocasta the Queen and she turns to one of her trusty and esteemed servants and uh, we're before a palace in some fashion. Jocasta and service, please. Oh, faithful servant of mine ancient sire, though unto thee sufficiently be known the whole discourse of my recureless grief, by seeing me from prince's royal state thus basely brought into so great contempt as mine own sons repine to hear my plaint. Now, of a queen but barely bearing name, saying this town seeing my flesh and blood against itself to levy threatening arms, whereof to talk it rends my heart in twain. Yet once again, I must to thee recomp the wailful thing that is already spread, because I know that pity will compel thy tender heart more than my natural child with ruthless tears to moan my mourning case. My gracious queen, as no man might surmount the constant faith, faith I bear my sovereign lord, so do I think for love and trusty zeal no son you have doth owe you more than I. For hereunto I am by duty bound with service meet no less to honour you than that renowned prince your dear father. And as my duties be most infinite, so infinite must also be my love. Then, if my life or spending of my blood may be employed to do your highness good, command, O queen, command this carcass here, in spite of death, to satisfy thy will. So, though I die, yet shall my willing ghost contentedly forsake this withered corpse, for joy to think I never showed myself ungrateful once to such a worthy queen. Thou knowst what care my careful father took in wedlock's sacred state to settle me with Lias, king of this unhappy Thebes. That most unhappy now our city is. Thou knowst how he, desirous still to search the hidden secrets of supernal powers, unto divines did make his oft recourse, of them to learn when he should have a son that in his realm might after him succeed, of whom, receiving answer sharp and sour, that his own son should work his wailful end. The wretched king, though all in vain, did seek for to eschew, that could not be eschewed. And so, forgetting laws of nature's love, no sooner had this painful womb brought forth his eldest son to this desired light, but straight, he charged a trusty man of his to bear the child into a desert wood and leave it there for tigers to devour. O oh, luckless babe, begot in woeful hour. His servant, thus obedient to his hest, up by the heels did hang this faultless imp, and piercing with a knife his tender feet, through both the wounds did draw the slender twigs which being bound about his feeble limbs were strong enough to hold the little soul. Thus did he leave this infant scarcely born, that in short times must need have lost his life, if destiny, that for our greater griefs decreed before to keep it still alive, had not unto this child sent present help, for so it chanced. A shepherd passing by with pity moved did stay his guiltless death, he took him home and gave him to his wife, with homely fare to feed and foster up. Now, 
Hearken how the heavens have wrought the way to Lias' death and to mine own decay. Experience proves, and daily it is seen, in vain, too vain, man strives against the heavens. Not far from thence, the mighty Polybus of Corinth king did keep his princely court, unto whose woeful wife, lamenting much, she had no offspring by her noble fear, the courteous shepherd gave my little son, which grateful gift the queen did so accept, as nothing seemed more precious in her sight, partly, but for that its features were so fine, partly for that he was so beautiful, and partly for because his comely grace gave great suspicion of his royal blood, the infant grew, and for and many years was deemed Polybus' son, till time that Oedipus, for so he named was, did understand that Polybus was not his sire indeed whereby forsaking friends and country there, he did return to seek his native stock, and being come into Phocides' land, took notice of the cursed oracle, how first he should his father do, do to death, and then become his mother's wedded mate. O fierce aspect of cruel planets all that can decree such seas of heinous faults. Then Oedipus, freight full of chilling fear, by all means sought to avoid this furious fate, uh, but whiles he weaned to shun the shameful deed, unlikely guided by his own mishap, he fell into the snare that most he feared. For lo, in, Phos in, for lo, in Phocides did Laius lie, to end the bro broils that civil discord then had raised up in that unquiet land, by means whereof my woeful Oedipus affording aid unto the other side, with murdering blade unwares his father slew. Thus heavenly doom, thus fate, thus powers divine, thus wicked reed of prophets took effect. Now only rests to end the bitter hap of me, of me, his miserable mother. Alas, how cold I feel the quaking blood pass to and fro within my trembling breast. Oedipus, when this bloody deed was done, forced forth by fatal doom to Thebes came, whereas, with, whereas full soon with glory he achieved the crown and scepter of this noble land by conquering Sphinx, that cruel monster, lo, that erst destroyed this goodly flourishing soil. And thus did I, O oh, hateful thing to hear, to my own son, become a wretched wife. No marvel, the, the golden sun withdrew his glittering beams from such a sinful fact. And so, by him that from this belly sprang, I brought to light, O cursed that I am, as well two sons, as daughters also twain. But when this monstrous manage was disclosed, so fore began the rage of boiling wrath to swell within the furious breast of him. As he himself, by stress of his own nails, out of his head did tear his griefful iron, unworthy more to see the shining light. How could it be that, knowing he had done so foul a blot, he would remain alive? So deeply faulteth none, the which unwares doth fall into the crime he cannot shun. And he, alas, unto his greater grief, prolongs the date of his accursed days, knowing that life doth more and more increase the cruel plagues of his detested guilt, where stroke of griefly death doth set an end unto the pangs of man's increasing pain. Of others all most cause have we to moan, thy woeful smart, O miserable queen, such and so many are thy grievous harms. Now to the end, this blind outrageous sire should reap no joy of his unnatural fruit. His wretched sons pricked forth by furious spite, adjudged their father to perpetual prison, there, buried in the depth of dungeon dark. Alas, he leads his discontented life, a cursing still his stony-hearted sons, and wishing all the infernal sprites of hell to breathe such poisoned hate into their breasts, as each with other fall to bloody wars. And so with pricking point of piercing blade to rip their bowels out, that each of them with other's blood might stain his guilty hands, and both at once by stroke of speedy death be forthwith thrown into the Stygian lake. 
Mighty gods prevent so foul a deed. They, to avoid the wicked blasphemies and sinful prayer of their angry sire, agreed thus, that of this noble realm, until the course of one full year was run, Eteocles should sway the kingly mace, and Polynice as ex ex exile should depart, till time expired, and then to Polynice Eteocles should yield the scepter up. Thus year by year, the one succeeding other, the royal crown should unto both remain. O oh, the unbridled minds of ambitious men. Eteocles, thus placed in princely seat, drunk with the sugared taste of kingly reign, not only shut his brother from the crown, but also from his native country's soil. Alas, poor Polynice, what might he do unjustly with his brother thus betrayed? To Argos he with sad and heavy cheer forthwith conveyed himself, on whom at length with fawning face good fortune smiled so, as with Adrastus, king of Argives there, he found such favour and affinity as, to restore my son unto his reign, he hath besieged this noble city Thebes. And hence proceeds my most extreme annoy. For of my sons, whoever do prevail, the victory will turn unto my grief. Alas, I fear such is the chance of war that one or both shall purchase death thereby. Wherefore, to shun the worst that may befall, though comfortless, yet as a pitiful mother whom nature binds to love her loving sons, and to provide the best for their avail, I have thought good by prayers to entreat the two brethren, nay, rather cruel foes, a while to stay their fierce and furious fight, till I have tried by means for to appease the swelling wrath of their outraging wills, and so with much to do at my request, they have forborne unto this only hour. Small space, God wot, to stint so great a strife. And even right now, a trusty man of mine returned from the camp, informing me that Polynice will straight to Thebes come. Thus of my woe this is the wailful sum. And for because in vain and bootless plaint I have small need to spend this little time, here will I cease in words more to bewray the restless state of my afflicted mind. Desiring thee, thou go to Eteocles, heartily on my behalf beseeching him that out of hand, according to his promise, he will vouchsafe to come unto my court. I know he loves thee well, and to thy words I think thou knowest he will give willing ear. O noble queen, sits unto such affairs is my speedy diligence so my speedy diligence is requisite i will uh, aptly uh, i will apply eff effectually to do what so your highness hath commanded me i will go in and pray the gods the while with tender titty with tender pity to appease my grief and with that Freudian slip, Jocasta goes off into the uh, of the stage into a palace. Uh, her four ma handmaidens follow her. The four chorus uh, make a beeline for the Paris, but they don't. They they don't leave. They stay on stage to remain on stage for the rest of the tragedy. We will pause there before the next uh, continuation of the action. Uh, it's labelled as Act One, Scene Two, but uh, the uh, service who uh, has been chatting to uh, Jocasta, remains on stage for a little bit longer. Um, yeah, uh, we've got a lot of alliteration here, haven't we? Freight full of chilling fear, by all means sought to avoid this furious fate. Um, yeah, it, 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 I have to say, I'm, I'm really leading into this. Uh, I don't know how casual a suggestion it was that this might be performed outdoors, because it's full of little little indicators that, that would, would fit that very well, because um, it is that kind of rhetoric that you you need to push sound out um and to be heard so yes if you if you don't know your oedipus story uh you do now um that covers uh, covers most of uh, the backstory quite nicely uh, a bit of an info burst there from jocasta uh, who doesn't once say i don't know why i'm telling you this um <laughs> uh thoughts from the room uh, eric uh, you kind of get the impression that service, you know, is kind of, I don't know, maybe sitting next to her, sort of you know, patting her hand, going like, it's fine, it's going to be fine. The mighty gods prevent so far the deed and like sort of making, I, I don't know, maybe this is me like influenced by TV stuff, but <laughs> it just feels a bit like she's just talking at him, not really to him. 
Well, he, does, he does seem to be almost a cheerleader to, you know, be... Uh, it, oh, that was awful. Is there more? Um, <laughs> the quality. Less less holding hand and more... more. Come on, you, you let it all out. Let it all out. Um, oh, that was exactly. awful. Terrible things. Other thoughts? We're all staggered by it all. Uh, Liza? Well, I do, I do see your point about um, the text serving a potential outdoor performance. Those alliterations really um, help. Uh, as exposition scenes go, this one is kind of clumsily done, it seems to me. Um, you know, long speeches uh, preceded by the words like, thou dost know, oh, you know this, you know how I war thing happen. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it gets the job done, but I don't love how it does it. Uh, but, it but it gets the job done, and it at least lets Jocasta tell her own story, which is cool, I guess. Uh, David? I mean, it is a bit clumsy, but it's also clear and quite touching as well, I think. So. Yeah, so I, I I I am a big fan of someone coming on stage and just telling us what's going on. Uh, so long as that that this is it, if they keep telling us stuff like this, then I I will start getting cross. But I I I can cope with it for five minutes. That's cool. Uh, I, I Eric. couldn't help because like I mean I've read like you know ancient Greek tragedy as well, not out loud, but like you know in the context of school and that kind of thing. Uh, but then after all the stuff that we've done, like, you know, Cleopatra and Gismond uh, and Tancred, I couldn't help but like go, where is the lovely poetry of, I mean, you know, the, the description is great, but then it doesn't have the same pace as those. It's got like those, like in Cleopatra, with, with the tragedy of Cleopatra that we did a few weeks ago or months, I don't know, time is weird. Um, it was just very sort of, you had the long speeches, but they were very vivid. They were very sort of, okay, not necessarily gripping, but I mean, <laughs> you know, you could sort of, they came to life. Whereas this is just like reporting stuff, but in a very labored fashion, I guess. Yeah, it's 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 a different rhythm. It's a different thing. And I do want, I, I, you know, I, I wasn't c coming into here thinking, thinking indoor, outdoor, but um, it, it would explain it. It would give us a very good reason for doing it that way. Um, I, I, but that's a, a massive bit of speculation with absolutely no support of it. So, um, Rachel. No, it's a, about what Eric was saying. I think in those other ones, the the rhythm is, was different. And also underneath you had some, uh, un, like this is very expositional. And I think in the other ones, there was, you know, a lot of stuff that was subtextual. It wasn't to extrapolate the story. It was it, it was to extrapolate the story, but at the same time, it was giving us um, insight into the personality of the characters and, and building those characters and giving us a reason uh, as to why we should care about them specifically as a character. Um, I think... Uh, I'm not saying that I I dislike Joe Costa, uh, but I feel like uh, the way that the, this was written, she s seems still more a bit of a distant historical figure, as opposed to the how some of the other text was living and and very tense. Like there was a lot of um. I don't know. That, that stuff underneath it maybe that's what eric means but that's well i guess I also it depends if it's like an artifact of the original or or not like i, I don't i don't i'm not familiar with the original but i mean classical greek tragedy is very sort of you know woe is me kind of thing yeah this this really doesn't have an analog in in the uh the 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 Euripides play that it's probably vaguely based on. Some of it does have direct scene par scenic parallels uh, and apart from the fact that uh, Chicasta turns up at the beginning and does a long speech uh, thus far we haven't really got any of this this feels like it's been added to explain the backstory um, uh, by the person that this is based on 
as it were. Remember, there's there's two steps removed. There's a step removed. Uh, there's a, there's a, a a play that this is translating from, which is vaguely connected with Euripides. So uh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, just yeah, uh, to amplify a note that's going on in the chat, we uh, punctuation is 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 rubbish. So just ignore the punctuation and punctuate as you wish. Um, we've got a lot of that. Uh, so full stops uh, you can largely ignore uh, and just put in a full stop where you think it uh, it uh, lives. Uh, other things are going out in the chat as we go along. So uh, we will see what we see uh, and see how it all goes. Hopefully it will all be fine and the, the people at home won't notice. So uh, we're going to go into Act 1, Scene 2, as it's listed here, and we'll run it into Act 1, Scene 3. So Jocasta has uh, uh, continued... And um, we will uh, we will move forward uh, with service, and in a moment we'll have a completely different uh, selection of people. So let us uh, let us go forth. Uh, uh, service is left alone. The simple man whose marvel is so great at stately courts and prince's regal seat with a gazing eye, but only doth regard the golden gloss that outwardly appears, the crowns bedecked with pearl and precious stones, the rich attire embossed with beaten gold lively, the glittering mace, the pomp of painted swarming train, the mighty halls heaped full of flattering friends, the chambers huge, the goodly gorgeous beds, the gilded roofs emb embowed with curious work, the faces sweet of fine disdaining dames, the vain suppose of wanton rain at last, but never views with eye of inward thought the painful toil, the great and grievous cares, the troubles still, the new increasing fears that princes nourish in their jealous breasts. He waiteth not, weigheth not, he, he weigheth not the charge that Jove had laid on princes, how for themselves they reign not. He wins the law, must stoop to princely, but princes fame frame their noble wills to law. He knoweth not, as the boisterous wind doth shake the tops of highest reared towers, so doth the force of froward fortune strike the white the highest sits in haughty state. Lo, Oedipus that sometime reigned king of Theban soil, that wanted to suppress the mightiest prince and keep him under check, that fearful was unto his foreign foes, now, like a poor afflicted prisoner in dungeon dark, shut up from cheerful light, in every part so plagued with annoy, as he harbors, as he abhors to lead a longer life, by means whereof the one against the other, his wrathful sons have planted all, all their force. And Thebes here, this ancient worthy town with threatening siege girt in on every side, in danger lies to be subverted quite. If help of heavenly Jove uphold it not, but as dark night succeeds the, the shining day, so lowering, lowering grief comes after pleasant joy. Well, now the charge her highness did command, I must fulfill, though haply all in vain. Service goeth off the stage by the gates called Electra. Antigone attended with her gentlewoman and her governor. Uh, 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 the, uh, cometh out of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the queen's palace. So uh, enter Balliol and Antigone. O gentle daughter of King Oedipus, sister dear to that unhappy wight whom brother's rage have reaved of his right, to whom thou knowest in young and tender years I was a friend and faithful governor. Come forth, sith that her grace hath granted leave, and let me know what cause hath moved now so chaste a maid to set her dainty foot over the threshold of her secret lodge. Since that the town is furnished everywhere with men of arms and warlike instruments, unto our ears there comes no other noise but sound of trump and neigh of trampling steeds, which running up and down from place to place, place with hideous cries betoken blood and death. The blazing sun nay shineth half so bright as it was wont to do at dawn of day. The wretched Danes throughout the woeful town together clustering to the temples go, beseeching Jove by way of humble plaint with tender ruth to pity their distress. Uh, the love I bear to my sweet Polynice, uh, my dear brother, 
is only ca cause hereof. Why, daughter, knowest thou any remedy how to defend thy father's city here from that outrage and fierce repining wrath which he against it just, justly hath conceived? O oh, governor, might this my faultless blood suffice to stay my brethren's dire debate with glad content I could afford my life betwixt them both to plant a perfect peace. But alas, but since, alas, I cannot as I would, a hot desire inflames my fervent mind to have a sight of my sweet Polynice. Wherefore, good guide, vouchsafe to guide me up into some tower about this hu huge court from whence I may behold our enemy's camp, thereby at least to feed my hungry eyes, but with the sight of my beloved brother, then if I die, contented shall I die. O oh, princely dame, the tender care thou takest of thy dear brother deserveth double praise. Yet cravest thou that which cannot be obtained by reason of the distance from the town unto the plain where the army lies encamped. And furthermore, beseemeth not a maid to show herself in such, such unseemly place. Whereas among some such young and less lusty troops of harebrained soldiers marching to and fro, both honest name and honour is impaired. But yet rejoice, sith in this thy great desire without long let or yet without thy pain. At wish one will shortly may be fulfilled. For Polynice forthwith will hither come. Even I myself was lately at the camp, commandeth by the queen to bid him come, who laboureth still to link in friendly league her jarring sons, which, hap, so hoped for, eftsoons I pray the gracious gods to grant. And sure I am that, ere this hour pass, thou shalt hear him in person safely see. Uh, ooh, loving friend, dost thou not then warrant me that Polynice will come unto this court? Ere thou beware, thou shalt him here behold. And who, alas, doth warrant his adventure, that of Etiocles he take no harm? For constant pledge he hath his brother's faith, he also he hath also the truth, the truce that yet endures. I fear, alas, alas, I greatly fear some trustless snare his cruel brother lays to trap him in. Oh, daughter, God knows how willing I would be with sweet relief to comfort thy distress, but I cannot impart to thee the good which I myself do not as yet enjoy. The wailful cause that moves Eteocles with Polynice to enter civil wars is over great, and for this only cause full many men have broke the laws of truth, and topsy-turvy turned many towns, desire to rule and reign in kingly state. Nay can he bide that sways a realm alone to have another joined with him therein. Yet must we hope for help of heavenly powers, so if they be just, their mercy is at hand to help the weak when worldly force doth fail. As both my brethren be, so both I bear, as much good will as any sister may, but yet the wrong that unto Polynice this tr trophless tyrant hath unjustly showed doth lead me more to wish the prosperous life of Polynices than of that cruel wretch. Besides that, Polynice, whiles he remained in Thebes here, did ever love me more than did Eteocles, whose swelling hate is towards me increased more and more, whereof I partly may assure myself, considering he disdains to visit me. Yea, haply he intends to reave my life, and having power he will not stick to do it. This therefore makes me earnestly desire oft times to see him, yet ever as I think, for to discharge the duty of a sister, the fear I have of hurt doth change as fast, my doubtful love into disdainful spite. 
Yet, daughter, must ye trust in mighty love, in mighty Jove. His will is not that for the fence of one, so many suffer undeserved smart. I mean of thee, I mean of Polynice, of Jocasta, thy woeful aged mother, and of Ismena, thy beloved sister, who though for this she doth not outwardly from dreary iron distill lamenting tears, yet do I think no less afflicting grief doth inwardly torment her tender breast. Besides all this, a certain jealousy, lately conceived, I know not whence it springs, of Creon, my mother's brother, appalls me much. Him doubt I more than any danger else. Dear daughter, leave this foolish jealousy, and seeing that thou shalt here shortly find thy brother Polynice, go in again. O oh, joyful would it be to me there while to understand the order of the host, whether it be such as have sufficient power to overthrow this mighty town of Thebes. What place supplies my brother Polynice? Where found ye him? What answer did he give? And though so great a care pertaineth not unto a maid of my unskillful years, yet for because myself partaker am of good and evil with this my country soil, I long to hear thee tell those fearful news, which otherwise I cannot understand. So noble a desire, O worthy dame, I much commend, and briefly as I can will satisfy thy hungry mind therein. The power of men that Polynice hath brought, whereof he, being addressed as son-in-law, take chiefest charge, is even the flower of Greece, whose huge train so mighty seems to be. And I see not how this our drooping town is able to withstand so strong a siege. Entering the field, their army did I find, so orderly in form of battle set, as though they would forthwith have given the charge. In battle seven, the host divided is, to each of which, by order of the king, a valiant knight for captain is assigned. And as you know, this city hath seven gates. So every captain hath his gate prescribed with fierce assault to make his entry at. And further, passing through our frowning foes that gave me countenance of a messenger, hard by the king, I spied Polynice in golden glistening arms, most richly clad, whose person many a stately prince impaled and many a comely crowned head enclosed. A sight of me, his colour straight he changed, and like a loving child, in clasped arms, he caught me up, and friendly kissed my cheek. Then hearing what his mother did demand, with glad consent according to her hest, gave me his hand to come unto the court, of mutual truce desirous so he seemed. He asked me of Antigone and Ismena, but chiefly unto thee above the rest, he gave me charge, most heartily to commend him. The God give grace he may at length possess his kingly right, and I his wished sight. Daughter, no more. Tis time ye now return. It stands not with the honour of your state thus to be seen suspiciously abroad. For vulgar tongues are armed evermore with slanderous brute to blemish the renown of virtuous dames, which though at first it spring of slender cause, yet doth it swell so fast, as in short space it filleth every ear with swift report of undeserved blame. You cannot be too curious of your name. Fond show of evil, though still the mind be chaste, decays the credit oft that ladies had. Sometimes the place presumes a wanton mind, Repair sometimes of some doth hurt their honour. Sometimes the light and garish proud attire persuades a yielding bent of pleasing youths. The voice that goeth of your unspotted fame is like a tender flower that with the blast of every little wind doth fade away. Go in, dear child. This way will I go. See if I can meet thy brother, Polynice. Antigone, with her maids, returneth into her mother's palace. Her governor goeth out by the gates. Uh, Holomoloides. Uh, the chorus, uh, which is four people, uh, will step forward. But at it's the moment it's just David. 
If greedy lust of man's ambitious eye, but thirsteth so for sway of earthly things, would eke foresee what mischiefs grow thereby, what careful toil to quiet state it brings, what endless grief from such a fountain springs, then should he swim in seas of sweet delight, that now complains of fortune's cruel spite. For then he would so safely shield himself with sacred rules of wisdom, sage advice, as no alluring train of trustless pelf to fond effects his fancy should entice. Then wary heed would quickly make him wise, where contrary such is our skillless kind. We most do seek, but most may hurt the mind. Amid the troop of these unstable toys, some fancies, lo, to beauty must be bent. Some hunt for wealth, and some set all their joys in regal power of princely government. Yet none of these from care are clean exempt. For either they begot with grievous toil, or in the end foregone with shameful foil. This flitting world doth firmly naught retain wherein a man may boldly rest his trust. Such fickle chance in fortune doth remain, and when she lust, she threateneth whom she lust, from high renown to throw him in the dust. Thus may we see that each triumphing joy by fortune's frown is turned to annoy. Those old elder heads may well be thought to err, the which for easy life and quiet days the vulgar sort would seem for to prefer. If glorious Phoebe withhold his glistering rays from such a peer as crown and sceptre sways, no marvel though he hide his heavenly face from us that come of less renowned race. Seld shall you see the ruin of a argumentum prince, but that the people eke like Brunt do bear, and old records of ancient time long since. From age to age, yea, almost everywhere, with proof hereof hath glutted every ear. Thus by the follies of the prince's heart, the bounden subject still receiveth smart. Lo, how unbridled lust of private reign hath pricked both the brethren unto war, yet Polynice with sign of less disdain against this land hath brought from countries far a foreign power to end this cruel jar, forgetting quite the duty, love and zeal he ought to bear unto this common weal. But whosoever gets the victory, we wretched dames, and thou, O noble town, shall feel thereof the woeful misery, thy gorgeous pomp, thy glorious high renown, thy stately towers, and all shall fall adown. Sith raging Mars will each of them assist in others' breast to bathe his bloody fist. But thou, O son of Samuel and of Jove, that tamed the proud attempt of giant strong, do thou defend even of thy tender love, thy humble thralls from this afflicting wrong, the God whom whilst of war hath now tormented long. So shall we never fail, nay day, nay night, with reverence due thy praises to recite. And thus ends the uh, first act uh, done by Mr. Kinwell Marsh. Um, so, uh, how was it for you? Um, uh, listening back or, uh, or, uh, or speaking it, how are we finding this particular play? It's not, it's, remember, it's, it's not the same uh, playwright as uh, supposes uh, yet. That's coming up in the next act. Angela. I'm really interested that it specifies the name of the gate that they're going out of. We've got these various gates. So it is, it's kind of like building up a case for this being outside. Because in those, um, in those gardens in the Inns of Court, there are actually lots of, you know, there's railings, you could set them up anyway. Actually, I don't think there are railings in 1566. <laughs> it's a bit of a later thing, but still. Um, but, you know, you could easily set them up in that way because you've got multiple buildings for things to go through, haven't you? It does kind of uh, lend itself to that. Mm. Uh, yes, other thoughts in the room uh, about uh, 
Antigone and uh, and uh, and uh, and what's going on in this scene? How we, how how are we finding it, David? There's still a lot of explication. I mean, Balio said that he would speak as briefly as he could, but thank goodness he spoke briefly because uh, otherwise it would have gone on forever, wouldn't it? Really, <laughs> <laughs> Eric. I was just wondering about service because like he just comes on to say, you know, the, we see all this beautiful glittering stuff and we think that being prince is easy, but then like we're not. It's not basically. Um, that's that's the Cliff Notes version. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> it, it <laughs> seems a bit like, I don't know, un not unnecessary necessarily. It just doesn't really give us any information, you know, about the plot or people. Mm. Uh, Angela, it does. It does, and I realise this is not written. It is not a Greek play, but it is very much written in the style of a proper Greek play, doesn't it? You could you could play this with a mask on. It's in all the action is you know it's only the words. It's only explication. It's it's interesting. It's like it's an exercise in producing something that is like. Um, you know, uh, Euripides might have written. <laughs> mm. With, without the poetry. Well, it's an interesting we're, question. We're is, still... that, is that the translator or is that the original uh, no, text? Translator. I mean, I'm looking at the original text yeah. now and um, of the, uh, the uh, Geocaster. Uh, 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 but I have no idea whether that's beautifully written or not. Um... <laughs> Well, you can send it to me. I, I, I speak old Italian. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an opera singer. It's my purview. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, we are getting some sense of character. We're getting a sense of, of who Antigone is. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. If, do we know why Balio is calling her her daughter? given that she's Oedipus and Yocasta's daughter? Was she fostered by him? I think he's just the governor of the children, isn't he? So it's like... Ah, the, like the two daughters. Yeah, so I think it sounds like he's just the, you know, like the nanny, only he was the boy's governor. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, and, and we've got a chorus, which is in verse, in Rhyme Royal, it looks like, something like it. Um, it's a, yeah, seven-line stanza. Um, so so that's a um that's kind of nice the the verse it's not badly written it's actually no. kind of there's some lovely lines in there well that that seemed to go more quickly than a lot of the the dialogue really hmm. uh, is I... it the same author uh, rob do you know the the chorus bit as the rest of the act uh, it, it appears to be yes. Um, it, it seems that the act and its chorus are, are a unified thing. It's said after that 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 was all, all done by uh, by uh, Kim Marsh, so uh, we can assume it was yes. But it might not. It could all be a lie. Um. <laughs> okay, are we ready to dive into uh, the second act? Uh, so. Uh, just uh, note ahead, uh, continuing the same theme. Uh, there doesn't appear to be too many big, big things, but do keep an eye on the chat for uh, uh, some warning. There's uh, there's a, a couple of warnings for Polynikes coming up um, to see uh, uh, just a couple of very minor things, uh, as well as the usual general thing of beware the punctuation. Um, so uh, let's hear about the dumb show, David, please. Before the beginning of this second act, did sound a very doleful noise of flutes, during the which there came in upon the stage two coffins covered with cerecloths, and brought in by eight in mourning weed, and accompanied with eight other mourners. And after they had carried the coffins about the stage, there opened and appeared a grave, wherein they buried the coffins and put fire to them. But the flames did sever and part in twain, signifying discord by the history of two brethren, whose discord in their life was not only to be wondered at, but being buried both in one tomb, 
as some writers affirm. The flames of their funerals did yet part the one from the other in like manner and would in no wise join into one flame. After the funerals were ended and the fire consumed, the grave was closed up again. The mourners withdrew them off the stage and immediately by the gates, homoloides. Enter Polynices accompanied with six gentlemen and a page that carried his helmet and target. He and his men unarmed, saving their gorgets for that they were permitted to come into the town in time of truce. To the end, Jocasta might bring the two brethren to a parley. And Polynices, after good regard, taken round about him, speak as followeth. I'm just going to pause here and just talk about this grave and this fire. Um, yeah. Again, uh, it's just another thing where I'm going, I don't want to do that indoors. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a nice, it's an interesting series. I, I sometimes like dumb shows. These, these are dumb shows I like. I'm liking these dumb shows. They're not people bringing on a small, a small animal that they hold. You know, right? Pegasus. So, yeah, little Pegasus. I'm <laughs> yeah. holding a Pegasus and a sword. That means you understand what I'm doing. Um, whereas this, <laughs> we've got uh, mourners and graves and coffins and fire, and even if you don't know what's going on, it's, it's cool. Um, that's a technical term for it. Uh, Rachel. Um, no, I, I, I think we're in mostly most agreement that this is like outside. So I think just that they're using fire. That's just more evidence that this is outside. You know, you don't want to inhale smoke like that indoors. Hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know um, uh, if it is or not. But at the moment, I'm really going with this tangent. It's um, uh, the, it might be. It's it's a really good. I've I've got no no reference to it being a, of that kind of st uh, staging uh, anywhere. But uh, it doesn't mean I haven't missed something. If it's not real fire, then it's a lot of crepe paper, isn't it? Yeah, fire. I demand fire. Have they invented crepe paper yet? I don't know. <laughs> Something similar. Might might be might be a textile, but yeah. yeah, lighting things on fire, much more fun. Yeah. Uh because health and safety hasn't been invented yet. Um okay. Oh, Sorry, health they, and what? Fires. And they, they won't be wanting to light one indoors. I mean, you know, London Bridge does keep burning down. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's a good reason also why so many theatres are named the Phoenix. Because um, <laughs> they have a tendency to burn to the ground. Uh, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, we will go into uh, action. We uh, have the entrance, uh, as, as said, um, uh, to a parley and parley nices after good regard. Taken round about him speaketh as followeth so we already still we always have the chorus on stage and jocasta will enter in a minute lo here mine own city and native soil lo here the nest i ought to settle in yet being thus entrenched with mine own towers and that from him the saved conduct is given which doth enjoy as much as mine should be my feet can tread no step no step without suspect from where my brother bides even there behooves more wary scout than in an enemy's camp yet while i may within this right hold right hand hold this brand this blade unyielden ever yet my life shall not be left without revenge but here behold this holy sanctuary of Bacchus ache the worthy image lo the altars where the sacred flames have shone and where of your these guiltless hands of mine full oft have offered to our mighty gods i see also a worthy company of theban dames resembling unto me the train of jocasta my dear mother behold them clad in clothes of grisly black that hellish hue that nay for other harms so well beseemed wretched whites to wear. For why? 
Ere long their selves themselves shall see gramercy to their prince's tyranny. Some spoiled of their sweet and sucking babes, some lease their husbands, others some their sire, and some their friends that were to them full dear. But now tis time to lay the sword aside and eke of them to know where is the queen. O worthy dames, heavy, unhappy ye, where resteth now the restless queen of Thebes? A worthy imp sprung out of worthy race, renowned prince whom we have looked for long, and now in happy hour art come to us. Some quiet bring to this unquiet realm. O queen, O queen, come forth and see thy son, the gentle fruit of all thy joyful seed. And uh, as we have the entrance of uh, Jocasta, which is intimated here, it's not actually an original uh, textual stage direction. And also I'll ask Angela to read the chorus from now on so that David can prepare to be somebody else. My faithful friends, my dear beloved maids, I come at call and at your words I move my feebled feet with age and agony. Where is my son? Oh, tell me, where is he for whom I sighed hath have so often sif, for whom I spend both nights and days in tears? Here, <coughs> here noble mother, here, not as the king, nor as a citizen of stately Thebes, but as a stranger now, I thank my brother. Oh, son, oh, sweet and my desired son, these eyes thee see, these hands of mine thee touch. Yet scarcely can this mind believe the same, and scarcely can this bruised breast sustain the sudden joy that is enclosed herein. O gladsome glass wherein I see myself. So grant the gods that for our common good you friendly may our sons both friends behold. At thy depart, O oh, lovely child, thou leftst my house in tears, and me thy wretched day mirror of martyrdom, lamenting still. The unworthy exile thy brother to thee gave, nay was there ever son or friend far off. Of his dear friends or, or mother so desired as thy return in all the town of Thebes, and of myself more than the rest to speak. I have, as thou mayst see, clean cast aside my princely robes, and thus in woeful weed be rapid have these lustless limbs of mine. Naught else but tears have trickled from mine eyes, and eke thy wretched, blind, and aged sire, since first he heard what war tween you there was, as one that did his bitter curse repent, or that he prayed to Jove for your decay with stretching string or else with bloody knife hath sought full oft to end his loathed life thou this meanwhile my son hast lingered long in far and foreign coasts and wedded eke by whom thou mayest who when heaven appoints it so strange issue have by one a stranger born which grieves me sore and much the more dear child because I was not present at the same, there to perform thy loving mother's due. But for I find thy noble match so meet and worthy both for thy degree and birth, I seek to comfort thee by mine advice, that thou return this city to inhabit, which best of all may seem to be the bower, both for thyself and for thy noble spouse. Forget thou then thy brother's injuries, and know, dear child, the harm of all mishap that haps twixt you must hap likewise to me. Nay can the cruel sword so slightly touch your tender flesh, but that the selfsame wound shall deeply bruise this aged breast of mine. There is no love may be compared to that the tender mother bears unto her child, for even so much the more it doth increase as their grief grows or contentate. I know not, mother, if I praise deserve, that you to please, whom I ought not displease, 
have trained myself among my trustless foes. But nature draws, whether he will or nil, each man to love his native country soil. And who should say that otherwise it were? His tongue should never with his heart agree. This hath me drawn. This hath me drawn. One second. This hath me. Oh my. Sorry, I lost my place while, while being uh, pushed around by a cat. Um, and uh, uh, Jocasta, nil, cat, one. And other results okay. will, will follow shortly. Um... This hath me drawn beside my bounden burden, my bounden due, to set full light this luckless life of mine, for of my brother what else, what may I else hope, but trains of treason, force, and falsehood both? Yet neither peril present nor to come can hold me from my due obedience. I grant I cannot grief, well behold, my father's palace, the holy altars know. Nay, lovely lodge wherein I fostered was, from whence driven out and chased unworthily. I have too long abode in foreign coasts, and as the growing green and pleasant plant doth bear fresh branches one above another, even so amid the huge heap of my woes, doth grow one grudge more grievous than the rest. To see my dear and doleful mother clad in mourning tire, to tire her mourning mind, wretched alonely for my wretchedness, so likes the enemy my brother best. Soon shall you see that in this wandering world no enmity is equal unto that, that dark disdain, the cause of every evil, doth breed full oft in consanguinity. But Jove, he knows what dole I do endure for you and my father wretched woe, and ache how deeply I desire to know what weary life my loving sisters lead, and what annoy mine absence them hath given. Alas, alas, how reekful wrath of gods doth still affect Oedipus' progeny. The first cause was thy father's wicked bed. And then, oh, why do I my plagues recompt my burden born and your unhappy birth? But needs we must with painful hearts abide what so from high the heavens do provide. With thee, my child, fain would I question yet of certain things. Nay, would I that my words might be annoyed, nay yet renew thy grief. Say on, dear mother, say what so you please. What pleaseth you shall never me disease. And seems it not a heavy hap, my son, to be deprived of thy country coasts. So heavy hap as tongue cannot express. And what may most molest the mind of man that is exiled from his native soil? The liberty he with his country lost, and that he lacketh freedom for to speak, what seemeth best without control or check. Why so? Each servant lacketh liberty to speak his mind without his master's leave. In exile every man, or bond or free, are life of noble race or mean parentage, bondman, is not in this unlike unto the slave, that must of force obey to each man's will, and praise the peevish of each man's pride. And seemeth this so grievous unto thee? What grief can greater be than so constrained? slave-like to serve gainst right and reason both yea much the more to him that noble is by stately line or yet by virtuous life and hath a heart like to his noble mind what helpeth most in such adversity hope helpeth most to comfort misery hope to return from whence he first was driven yea hope that happeneth oftentimes too late and may die before such hap may fall. And how didst thou before thy manage, son, maintain thy life, a stranger so bestead? Sometime I found, though seldom so it were, some gentle heart that could for courtesy content himself to succour mine estate. Thy father's friends and thine, did they not help for to relieve that naked need of thine? 
mother, he hath a foolish fantasy that thinks to find a friend in misery. Thou mightst have helped by thy nobility. Covered, alas, in a cloak of poverty. Well, ought we then that are but mortal here, above all treasure count our country dear, Yea, let me know, my son, what caused thee moved to go to Greece? The flying fame that thundered in mine ears. How King Adrastus, governor of Greece, was answered by Oracle that he should knit in links of lawful marriage his two fair daughters and his only heirs, one to a lion, the other to a boar, an answer such as each man wondered at. And how belongs this answer now to thee? I took my, I took my, my geese, even by this ensign here, a lion, lo, which I did always bear, yet think I not but Jove alone brought these hands of mine to such an eye expo exploit. And how yet came it to this strange effect? The shining day had run his hasted course, and dewy night bespread her mantle dark. When I that wandered after weary toil to seek some harbor for mine irked limbs, gain find at last a little cabin close adjoined fast unto the stately walls where King Adrastus held his royal towers. Scarce was I there in quiet well e couched, but thither came another exile e named Tidius, who strove perforce to drive me from this sorry seat and so at last we settled us to fell and bloody fight, whereof the rumor grew so great forthwith that straight the king informed was thereof, who, seeing then the ensigns that we bear to be, e to be even such as were to him foresaid, chose each of us to be his son by law, and Sithens did solemn solemnize ache the same. Uh, yet would I know if that thy wife be such as thou canst joy in her, or what she is? O oh, mother dear, fairer, nay, wiser dame, is none in Greece. Argea is her name. How couldst thou to this doubtful enterprise so many bring, thus armed all at once? Adrasta swore that he would soon restore unto us unto our right both T Tidius and me, and first for me that had the greater need, whereby the best and boldest bloods in Greece have followed me unto this enterprise, a thing both just and grievous unto me, grievous I say, for that I do lament, to be constrained by such open wrong, to war against mine own dear country fairs. But unto you, O mother, doth pertain to stint this strife, and both deliver me from exile now and ache the town from siege. For otherwise, I swear you here by heavens, Eteocles, who now doth me disdain, for brother shortly shall see me his lord. I ask the seat whereof I ought of right, possess the half, I am Oedipus's son and yours, so am I true son to you both. Wherefore, I hope that as in my defense, the world will weigh, so Jove will me assist. And as oh, he said his name, and therefore, Ateocles comes in, and it's all going to kick off. Uh, or is it? We shall see. Um, this is what happens when you don't have a clear line of succession. Yeah, let's let's alternate kingship. Yeah, that'll be a that's a great plan. Great plan. Never no no. We've read a lot of these plays now where uh, where uh, you know making absolute clear distinctions as who's in charge. Very important. Very important. Um, yeah. Uh, thoughts uh, from the room. We've got one son uh, and mother, and we've got the other brother coming in as well. Um, uh, David. I don't know whether it's now because it's uh, being written by Gascoigne or I think it's probably more the relationship between Jocasta and her son, but I feel that it's flowing much more now and there's a, a I'm, I'm more, I feel, I feel more involved, I think. Hmm. 
Uh, yes, and it may also have slightly more uh, connection with Euripides as well. This this scene, I think, actually has a, a much more a parallel in the potentially hinted at saucy-ish sort of play, um, though uh, though I say quite quite distant. Um, uh, yeah, uh, other thoughts? Are we? Are, uh, is everyone else feeling feeling the love for Gascoigne as opposed to uh, 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 the other chap? Whose name begins with K, which is just far too long. Uh, Kill Well Marsh, that's the one. Uh, Rachel, then Angela. I think this, the, the, you know, the feeling, the love for this scene comes more, it comes out because it's a mother talking to her son, and it's not a royal personage talking to, you know, a servant or somebody that they've paid or a governor. And you know, maybe there's that relationship between the governor and um, and Antigone, but you know, not as many people I think have had you know a governor in childhood as maybe somebody back then would have had if they were rich and this play was being played to them. Uh, Angela, I mean, I did think that uh, we are getting. You know, there's a lot of work being put in here as well to make Polynices, you know, clearly very honourable, very human. Um, so that sense of the human, which is what you certainly get out of Oedipus, I don't know, don't know, Shakaster play, but you're really getting this with him. He's got flaws, you know, he's angry, but he's also honourable. He loves his mother. Um, it's kind of interesting. You're really getting a lot of character, I think, through this uh, conversation as well as what Rachel was saying about this interesting, you know, to and forth between them. Mm. Uh, are there thoughts before we move on? Because we're halfway through the scene. Uh, we've had one side of the story, as it were, um, and uh, and things as we, we go forward. I'm going to uh, swap the choruses round once again. Uh, Eric, could you read the chorus going forward for a bit? Uh, and that should uh, give everyone a, a reasonable... Uh, mix as it were just a note for the chorus uh, you don't say uh, polynice in on the second line that's uh, you don't say that everything else there is uh, moderately accurate um, uh, and other stuff I'll throw in the chat for Jocasta's speech coming up um, uh, not the next one the one after so you've got plenty of time uh, okay uh, unless there's any additional thoughts at this time we will dive into <gasps> a tear please cometh in here by the gates uh, Electro himself armed and before him 20 gentlemen 20 20 gentlemen in armour his two pages whereof the one beareth his target the other his helmet Behold, O queen, behold, worthy queen, unworthy he, Eteocles, here comes. So would the gods that in this noble realm should never long unnoble tyrant reign, or that with wrong the right and doubtless heir should banished be out of his princely seat. Yet thou, O queen, so file thy sugared tongue, and with such counsel deck thy mother's tale that peace may both the brothers' hearts inflame, and rancor yield that erst possess the same. Mother, behold, your hests for to obey. In person now am I resorted hither. In haste, therefore, fain would I know what cause with hasty speed so moved have your mind to call me now so causeless out of time when commonwealth most craves my only aid. Fain would I know what quaint commodity persuades you thus to take a truce of for time and yield the gates wide open to my foe the gates that might our stately state defend, and now are made the path of our decay. Repress, dear son, those raging storms of wrath that so bedim the eyes of thine intent, as when the tongue, a ready instrument, would fain pronounce the meaning of the mind, it cannot speak one honest seemly word, but when disdain is shrunk or set aside, and mind of man with leisure can discourse what seemly words his tale might best beseem, and that the tongue unfolds without effects, then may proceed an answer sage and grave, and every sentence sauced with soberness. Whereby unbend thine angry brows, dear child, and cast thy rolling eyes none other way, that here dost not Medusa's face behold, but him, even him, thy blood, 
and brother dear. And thou behold my Polynices eke thy brother's face, wherein when thou mayst see thine own image, remember therewithal that what offence thou wouldst to him were done, the blows thereof re rebound unto thyself. And hereof eke I would you both forewarn, when friends or brethren, kinsfolk or allies, whose hasty hearts some angry mood had moved, be face to face by some of pity brought, thy swelling heart, puffed up with wicked ire, can scarce procure one inward loving thought. Who seeks to end their discord and debate, they only ought consider well the cause for which they come, and cast out of their mind for evermore the old offences past, so shall sweet peace drive pleading out of place. Wherefore, the first shall Polynices be to tell what reason first his mind did rule, that thus our walls with foreign foes enclosed in sharp revenge of causeless wrongs received, as he alleggeth by his brother's doom. And of this wicked woe and dire debate, some god of pity be the equal judge, whom I beseech to breathe in both your breasts a yielding heart to deep desire of peace. My worthy dame, I find that tried truth doth best beseem a simple naked tale. Nay needs to be with painted process prick that in herself hath no diversity, but always shows one undisguised face where deep deceit and lies must seek the shade and wrap their words in guileful eloquence as ever wrought with contrariety. So have I often said and say again that to avoid our father's foul reproach and bitter curse, I parted from this land with right good will, yet thus with him agreed that well the whirling wings of flying time might roll one year about the heavenly sphere, so long, alo so long alone he might with peace possess our father's seat and princely diadem. And when the year should ache his course renew, might I succeed to rule again as long, and that this law might still be kept for I? He bound himself by vow of solemn oath, by gods, by men, by heaven, and ache by earth, yet that forgot, without all reverence unto the gods, without respect to right, without respect that reason ought to rule, his faith and troth both trodden underfoot, he still usurps most tyrant-like with wrong, the right that doth of right to me belong. But if he can with equal doom consent that I return into my native soil to sway with him alike the kingly seat and evenly bear the bridle both in hand, dear mother mine, I swear by all the gods to raise with speed the siege from these our walls and send the soldiers home from whence they came, which if he grant me not, then must I do, though loath, as much as right and reason would, to venge my cause that is both good and just. Yet this in heaven the gods my records be, and here in earth each mortal man may know that never yet my guiltless heart did fail, brotherly duty to Eteocles, and that causeless he holds me from mine own. Thus have I said. O oh, mother, even as much as needful is, wherein I me assure, wherein I me assure that in the judgment both of good and bad, my words may seem of reason to proceed, constrained thus in my defense to speak. None may deny, O oh, pure princely race, but that thy words are honest, good, and just, and such as well beseem that tongue of thine. If what to some seems honest, good, and just, could seem even so in every doubtful sundry mind, no dark debate nor quarrel could arise. But look how many men, so many minds, and that that one man judgeth good and just, some other deems as deeply to be wrong. To say the truth, mother, this mind of mine doth fleet full far from that far fetch of his. Nay will I longer cover my conceit. 
If I could rule or reign in heaven above, and eke command in depth of darksome hell, no toil nor travail should my sprites abash to take the way unto my restless will, to climb aloft nor down for to descend. Then think you not that I can give consent to yield a part for my possession, wherein I live and lead the monarchy. A witless fool may every man him guess that leaves the more and takes him to the less. With this reproach might to my name redound, if he that hath with foreign power spoilt our pleasant fields might reave from me perforce what so he list by force of arms demands. No less reproof the citizens ensues if I for dread of Greekish hosts should grant that he might climb to height of his desire. In fine, he ought not thus of me to crave accord or peace with bloody sword in hand, but with humility and prayer both, for often is it seen and proof doth teach sweet words prevail where sword and fire do fail. Yet this, if here within these stately walls he list to live, the son of Oedipus, and not as king of Thebes, I stand content. But let him think, since now I can command, this neck of mine shall never yield to yoke of servitude. Let bring his banner splayed, let spear and shield, sharp sword and cindering flames procure the part that he so vainly claims. As long as life within this breast doth last, I nil consent that he should reign with me. If law of right may any way be broke, desire of rule within a climbing breast to break a vow may bear the buckler best. Who once hath passed the bounds of honesty in earnest deeds may well pass it in words. Oh, son, amongst so many miseries, this benefit hath crooked age, I find, that as the track of trustless time hath taught, it seeth much and many things discerns which reckless youth can never rightly judge. Oh, cast aside that vain ambition that corrosive, that cruel pestilence that most infects the minds of mortal men. In princely palace and in stately towns it creepeth oft and close with it conveys to leave behind it damage and decays. By it be love and amity destroyed. It breaks the laws and common concord beats. Kingdoms and realms it topsy-turvy turns, and now even thee her gall so poisoned hath that the weak eyes of thine affection are blinded quite, and see not to themself. But worthy child, drive from thy doubtful breast this monstrous mate, instead whereof embrace equality, which stately states defends, and binds the mind with true and trusty knots of friendly faith, which never can be broke. This right of man should properly possess, and who that other doth the more embrace shall purchase pain to be his just reward, by wrathful woe or else by cruel death. This first divided all by equal bonds what so the earth did yield for our avail. This did divide the nights and days alike, and that the veil of dark and dreadful night, which shrouds in misty clouds the pleasant light, nay, yet the golden beams of Phoebus' rays, which clears the dimmed air with gladsome gleams, can yet heap hate in either of them both. If then the days and nights to serve our turn content themselves to yield each other place, well oughtest thou with weighty doom to grant thy brother's right to rule the reign with thee which heavens ordained common to you both. If so thou nil, O son, O cruel son, in whose high breast may justice build her bower when princes' hearts wide open lie to wrong. Why likes thee so the top of tyranny with others lost to gather greedy gain? Alas, 
How far he wanders from the truth that compts of pomp all other to command, yet cannot rule his own unbridled will. A vain desire much riches to possess, whereby the breast is bruised and battered still, with dread, with danger, care, and cold suspect. Who seeks to have the thing we call enough? Acquaint him first with contentation, for plenteousness is but a naked name, and what sufficeth use of mortal men shall best appay the mean and modest hearts. These hoarded heaps of gold and worldly wealth are not the proper goods of any one, but pawns which Jove powers out abun pours out abundantly, that we likewise might use them equally. And as he seems to lend them for a time, even so in time he takes them home again. And would that we acknowledge every hour that from his hands we did the same receive. There nothing is so firm and stayed to man, but whirls about with wheels of restless time. Now, should if I should this one thing thee demand, which of these two thou wouldest choose to keep, the town quiet or unquiet tyranny? <clears throat> and wouldst thou say, I chose my kingly chair, a witless answer, sent from wicked heart. For if so, for if so fall, which mighty God defend, thine enemy's hand should overcome thy might, and thou should see them sack the town of Thebes, the chastest virgins ravishing for wreck, the worthy children in captivity. Then shouldst thou feel that scepter, crown, and wealth yield deeper care to see them taken away than to possess them yieldeth deep content. Now to conclude, my son, ambition is it that most offends thy blinded thought. Blame not thy brother, blame ambition, from whom if that so thou do not redeem thyself, I fear to see thee by repentance dear. Yes, dear, too dear, when it shall come too late. And now to thee, my Polynices, dear, I say that silly was Adrastus' reed, and thou, God, knowest a simple silly soul. He, he, to, to be rule, ru, he to be ruled by thy heady will, and thou to war against the Theban walls, these walls, I say, whose gates thyself should guard. Tell me, I pray thee, if the city yield, or thou it take by force in bloody fight, which never grant the gods, I then beseech. What spoils, what palms, what sign of victory canst thou set up to have thy country won? What title worthy of immortal fame shall blazed be in honor of thy name? O oh, son, dear son, believe thy trusty dame. The name of glory shall thy name refuse, and fly full far from all thy fond attempts. But if so fall thou shouldst be overcome, then with what face can thou return to Greece, that here hast left so many Greeks on ground? Each one shall curse and blame thee to thy face, as him that only causeth their decay, and eke condemn a drastic simple head that such a fear had chosen for his child. So may it fall in one accursed hour that thou mayst lose thy wife and country both, both which thou mayst with little toil attain if thou canst leave high mind and dark disdain. O, might, o, o mighty gods of goodness, never grant unto these evils, but set desired peace between the hearts of these two friendly foes. The question that betwixt us two is grown, believe me, mother, cannot end with words. You waste your breath, and I but lose my time, and all your travel lost and spent in vain. For this I swear, that peace you never get between us two, but with condition that whilst I live I will be Lord of Thebes. Then set aside these vain for wasted words, and yield me leave to go where need doth press, and now, good sir, get you out of these walls, unless you mean to buy abode with blood. 
And who is he that seeks to have my blood and shall not shed his own as fast as mine? By thee he stands and thou standst him before. Lo here the sword that shall perform his word. And this shall ache maintain my rightful cause. O oh, sons, dear sons, away with glittering arms. And first, before you touch each other's flesh with doubled blows, come pierce this breast of mine. Ah, wretch, thou art both vile and coward-like. Thy high estate esteems thy life too dear. If with a wretch or coward shouldst thou fight, O dastard villain, when first moved thee with swarms of Greeks to take this enterprise. For well I wish that cankered heart of thine could safely keep thy head within these walls and flee the field when combat should be called. This truce assureth thee, Polynices, and makes thee bold to give such boasting words. To be thou sure that had this truce not been, then long ere this, these hands had been imbrued, and eke this soil besprinkled with thy blood. Not one small drop of my blood shalt thou spill, but buy it dear against thy cankered will. O oh, sons, my sons, for pity yet refrain! Uh, good gods, whoever saw so strange a sight, true love and friendship both be put to flight. Yield, villain. Yield my right which thou withholdest. Cut off thy hope to reign in Theban walls. Nought hast thou here, nor aught shall ever have. Away! Oh, altars of my country soil. Whom thou art come to spoil and to deface. Oh, Gods, give ear unto my honest cause. With foreign power his country to invade. O holy temples of the heavenly gods. That for thy wicked deeds do hate thy name. Out of my kingdom am I driven by force. Out of the which thou camest me for to drive. Punish, O gods, this wicked tyrant here. Pray to the gods in Greece and not in Thebes. No savage beast so cruel nor unjust. Nor cruel to my country like to thee. Since from my right I am with wrong deprived. Eke from my life if long thou tarry here. O oh, father, hear what injuries I take. As though thy devilish deeds were hid from him. And you, mother. Have done! Thou not deservest with that false tongue thy mother wants to name. Oh, dear city. When thou arrivest in Greece, choose out thy dwelling in some musty moors. I must depart, and parting must I praise. Oh, dear mother, the depth of your goodwill. Oh, son. Away, I say, out of these walls. I cannot choose, but must thy will obey. Yet grant me once my father fool to see. I hear no prayers of my enemy. Where be my sweet sisters? And canst thou yet with shameless tongue once name thy noble race that art become a common foe to Thebes? Be sure thou shalt them never see again, nor other friend that in these walls remain. Rest you in peace, O worthy mother mine. How can that be, and thou my joy in war? Henceforth, nay, am I your joy, nay, yet your son. Alas, the heavens me whelm with all mishap. Lo, hear the cause that stirreth me by wrong. Much more is that he proffereth unto me. Well, speak. Darest thou come armed to the field? So dare I come. Wherefore dost thou demand? For needs, or thou must end this life of mine, or quench my thirst with pouring out thy blood. Ah, wretch, my thirst is all as dry as thine. Alas, and well away! What hear I, sons? How can it be? Dear children, can it be that brethren's hearts such rancour should enrage? And that right soon the proof shall plainly show.
Oh, oh, say not so, yet say not so, dear sons. O royal race of Thebes, now take thine end. Blood shield. O oh, slow and sluggish heart of mine, why do I stay to brew these slothful hands? But for his greater grief I will depart, and at return, if here I find my foe, this hasty hand shall end our hot debate. And a tear, please, goeth out by the gates of Electra. Dear citizens, and you eternal gods, bear witness with me here before the world, how this my fierce and cruel enemy, whom causeless now my brother I do call, with threats of death my lingering steps doth drive, both from my right and from my country's soil, not as beseems the son of Oedipus, but as a slave, an abject, or a wretch. And since you be both pitiful and just, vouchsafe, O oh gods, that as I part with grief, so may I yet return with joyful spoil of this accursed tyrant, and he slain, I may recover quietly mine own. And Polynice goeth out by the gates of Homo Lloydes. O oh, wretched, wretched Jocasta, where is found the misery that may compare to thine? Oh, would I had nor gazing eyes to see, or listening ears to hear that now I dread. But what remains save only to entreat that cruel dole would get yet so courteous be to reave the breath out of this woeful breast before I hearken to some woeful news. Rest you here, dames, and pray unto the gods for our redress. And I, in that meanwhile, will shut myself from sight of loathsome light. And Jocasta goeth into her palace. Almighty God, the governor of Thebes, pity with speed the pain Jocasta bides, and eke our needs, O mighty Bacchus, help, bend willing ear unto our just complaint. Leave them not comfortless that trust in thee. We have no gold nor silver at thee to give, no sacrifice to those thine altars due. Instead, whereof we consecrate our hearts to serve thy will and hests for to obey. And while the chorus is praying to Bacchus, Satercles returneth. But that's all we have time for this session in terms of text. Thoughts from the room. It's all hotting up here. Uh, brother on brother. Um, the, the, the words are flying everywhere. We go from long speeches to sudden and then shorter speeches uh, back at each uh, back and forth and then it goes to single lines back and forth um mother in the middle as well it's uh, it's yeah it's, it gets much more complex as we go david whether it is designed to be performed outside or in i mean i do agree with angela that place and space is so crucial to this it seems almost like a a protagonist in itself with the with the gates and the, the sense of the city i think is so so important Mm, yes, I mean, it's, uh, you know, seven at Thebes um, with at least uh, th th two or three of the gates uh, in evidence yeah. here. And, you know, those 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 are really referenced. So, yeah, that, that's 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 important as part of the staging. Um, other thoughts, Rachel? Um, This scene, I think, is so is so rich. It gives you so much of their family dynamic too i think um that they're not here in front of the the king you know of this grecian king is not there as a third party uh, witnessing their dispute here it's their mother you know there's no outside counsel it's their mother they're acting like children in front of her and in the end they devolve into children and they start throwing insults to towards each other and at the same time it makes me wonder what their ages are, um, you know, and it is Polynices the younger brother, but he's the favored brother, and that's why he's gotten this. And uh, there's part, a part where Polynices says that, you know, so, something about, you know, people who say big words are liars, and then he goes off into all these large words. Uh, and I think there is a lot of... Uh, charismatic he's a very charismatic individual and he uses that on purpose and then also the i guess the chorus members that come in with polynices and etiocles and 
Polynices has a smaller faction, uh, and then Eteocles has a larger faction, and maybe that's also their styles of rule. Hmm. Yeah, no, excellent uh, thoughts. Other thoughts on the room? Liza? Well, I was absolutely fascinated by this section where, um, where Polynices is, is attempting to say a prayer and Eteocles interrupts him after every line to essentially heckle. Um, because when I read... Uh, when I, uh, thank you. No idea why that happened. Um, sneeze gods, yes. Uh, when I read it first, um, I, I thought, uh, you know, is it, is it line for line combat like we've seen before in other plays? Is it two overlapping monologues that they're simply saying on alternate lines? No, but no, it's one, it's one monologue, Polynices, with interruptions by Eteocles, such as we, and we've seen this format before, but only when it's a vice or a clown uh, interrupting someone else or, or, or repeating them wrongly or, or, you know, sending them up in some way. Um, but this is a tragedy. We're supposed to take it seriously. Uh, are we? I don't know how this scene would play in front of an audience. Um, you know, whether they would both be, be facing out trying to gain the audience's sympathy. Um, it seems very much uh, like a recent presidential debate. More I will not say. <laughs> It's interesting. Um, yeah, the the uh, the question of tra textual transmission here as well uh, is really interesting. I mean, it doesn't really matter for our our, our benefit, but um, uh, it, it does seem to have a reasonable uh, parallel in uh, Euripides' uh, Phoenician Women. This scene, um, and then we obviously it's translated from a version of that. Um, so I'm I'm really quite interested about now uh, what interesting textual shifts have occurred between this. Whereas the first uh, act and earlier uh, material uh, generally there isn't a particularly good parallel the, there are lots of parallel lines and the shape of speeches is similar uh, based on my looking at a translation of some Euripides uh, and just scanning through it it does seem to match but whether the intentions are the same by the time we got to this iteration is is, is a really interesting question um, I say it doesn't matter for us because we're only really interested in what this author these authors are trying to do um and and what we might want to do with that uh angela did i see a wave i did but i, I actually realized that i'd forgotten the thing that had come to me earlier <laughs> however i mean but I, I i'm interested how etiocles there is nothing good about him <laughs> so although it's undoubtedly the case that it's a bad thing to wage war against your own country. Um, you know, uh, it, nevertheless, you know, it's kind of interesting that he, he accepts no blame whatsoever. So I think you're right about the vices thing. You know, this is these are very clearly right and wrong. We don't he's not a flawed figure. He's entirely flawed. You know, there's no good in him, um, which is kind of interesting. There's a slight lack there. So it makes it difficult, I would think, to be a Tyrocles because you're just a villain. Um, you're nothing else. There's not much depth to you. But it, it strikes me that this, you know, this great argument, there's a lot of declaiming and moving around and there's weapons. So this is a really big, you know, spacey uh, discussion, isn't it? Because you've got to get that sense of danger with these uh, swords and all that sort of thing being whipped out um, and, and people being threatened with them. It's very, it would be very exciting to see. Well, yeah, especially because I mean, we've got d details, you know, we know that there are an awful lot of people on stage, you know, uh, Polynices company with six gentlemen and a page that carries his uh, helmet. Uh, but then Ateocles turns up with 20. So he's actually outnumbering them, um, if I read that correctly. Um, so um, unless there's an error in the, uh, the, the numbering there. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of people here and you're right. There's there's this posturing in front of your posse uh, and your enemy's posse as well. Um, that's that could be part of the dynamic. David, did you feel that you were a, a, an out and out villain there? Um, I, I mean, or are I, you just I, misunderstood? I, I, think... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he sees himself as the strong ruler, doesn't he? I mean, having gained power, having been in um, 
in power at this stage. I think he wants a sense of consistency. I think I think he probably is out and out and out and out villain. But I mean, I think he's ar he's arguing a point of of a, of a of a consistency and unity of rule. And his brother, had his brother returned on his own, then he would have just he probably would have overcome him because he was weak. But his his argument is that his brother's turned up with foreign forces, so of course he has to combat them. That's mm. what a ruler does. Uh, Rachel. Uh, um, this is about like Joe Costa. I think how, how I said like it could be like you know the, this family dynamic and it has some the personality of the family and how each of them were treated inside that family. I think also you know Joe Costa is older. She's been married to two K. She's lived through two reigns and this is the third reign she's living in. Um if they don't team up together as brothers, you know, what's the guarantee that, that you know, the, this Grecian king isn't gonna usurp them and, and just take this over. I think she wants to see them join together to fight them back because there is an enemy host here that she's describing and they're in the streets and they're walking around. Um, and Eteocles does make the point that if fighting happens, they're gonna be fighting in, you know, our farms, and they're going to be, you know, messing with our, uh, you know, women and stuff like that. Um, I think I think in that in that way he is a good ruler. And but I think they're both they both want it the kingship that bad that they don't care that it rips the country apart. Mm. But you have Joe Costa mm. here trying to keep the kingdom together. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Jocasta. I mean, certainly in this scene, Jocasta is clearly the centre of sympathy, and she, she does get some very good lines. Um, I think they're twins, aren't they? Aren't they the two sets of children are twins? I get that impression from earlier in the play. Mm. So that's why they, they should be equal. We haven't got an easy... Um... Yes, I, I wondered about that. Jocasta seemed to say God ordained they should share the throne. Sorry, I talked over people. Yeah, no, I think mm -hmm. I think you you stepped in in in, in good time. Uh, Eric, what did you uh, have to say? I was going to say that uh, well, basically what Rachel was saying, where you've got like the sort of Jocasta standing in between them as sort of arbiter, but then it kind of it's weird because it, it sort of starts. It's like both a family matter and a political matter. So mm -hmm. like I mean, it's sort of you know like not necessarily life or death. It is life or death. But I mean. Um, <laughs> kind of you, you can kind of see her going yeah now shake hands and apologize to each other but also don't ruin the kingdom it's gonna you know people are gonna die if you two fight mm. uh, the stakes are real the stakes are big uh i mean jocasta's had a pretty tough old life as well i mean as as explicated at length at the beginning of the play uh you know this this is this is one quite messed up family uh, in many ways. Uh, David then Liza. I mean, uh, uh, looking back at, back over what we've read so far, looking back to the beginning, um, uh, as a um, a political stroke family drama, um, while uh, the early scene was being read between Servus and Jocasta. Um, with this idea in mind that um, it was outside, um, I couldn't help but think that uh, Servus might be uh, Oprah to um, Jocasta's Megan. Well, I would certainly be honored by the comparison. Yeah. Um, jo Jocasta, you know, in the first scene where she was basically doing exposition and saying she felt sad about it, um, that intrigued me less than this most recent scene, which is a wonderful scene. I love the speech about equality. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, she's passionate, she's eloquent, she's taking no, no shit whatsoever from either of her sons, um, including, including Polynices. Uh, you know, she's like, You're, you were both stupid to do what you did, and you both need to do something different. Mm -hmm. I, I was fascinated by the idea of the title character being a woman who is depicted as being old. Like, um, 
and I, I'm very intrigued by this this writing for her, and I wonder who might have played her. Usually, if it's an older woman, it's not a. It's often if it's an older woman, it's not a boy actor. Uh, it's a it's a mature actor, um, and certainly on the Greek stage, it, uh, Hecuba uh, or Iocasta would have been would have been played by men, not boys. So, this is a serious part written for a serious mature actor, and I'm. And I was thrilled to be reading it. Well, I say we we we. I, I don't know about the uh, uh, plays at Gra uh, Gray's Inn uh, who they use um, uh, in terms of their actors. So it could still just be a, uh, one of their contemporary students. But I suppose it could be it could be anyone. I really don't know. There there is an awful lot about uh, Inns of Court plays that I, I I want to sort of dig into. Uh, we were discussing this before we went on camera. Uh, yeah, I really like the idea that. Um, yeah, we could we could trim down effectively Act One, uh, that that opening thing, and into almost an interview for television, couldn't we? Um, you know that that it does function that way um, uh, before we actually sort of get into the meat, as it were, um, and the, the the that Act Two scene that that really is is doing stuff that's uh, that's that's doing a, a really interesting job. Um, does anyone have any final thoughts? They're bursting through in because we have we have hit. Uh, the end of extra time, actually. To, uh, this the, we had a lot of text to get through today, so if anyone's bursting to speak, otherwise I won't go around the room. I see wavering, but I'm not seeing energetic waving. So I'm going to say uh, we've got halfway through Act Two. We have more uh, Jocasta to go. We're going to find out where this play takes us uh, next time uh, when we continue with uh, more text uh, translated by Gascoigne and see what we get out of that. Uh, thank you very much to all the wonderful readers in the room. Thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye.